Oh, in this lecture, we're going to study chapter eight, stock valuation. So there are two approaches to stock valuation. So the first approach is to use multiples or devaluation ratios. This is very common in practice. The most popular valuation ratio is P ratio or price to earnings ratio. Essentially, you can come up with some sort of benchmark P ratio and multiply that by earnings per share or EPS to come up with a stock price. And the benchmark P ratio is often an industry average or sometimes based on a company's own historical values. For instance, suppose a company had earnings per share of $3 over the past year. And industry average P ratio is, is 12 times. Then we can estimate the stock price by multiplying these two numbers. Then we'll get $36. So that's our estimate of stock price. So you can compare, if you compare the current stock price, the actual price they're trading in the market to our estimate, if the current stock price is lower than our estimate, then we conclude that the stock is undervalued, then we want to, may want to buy the stock. On the other hand, if the current stock price is higher than our estimate, then we conclude that the stock is overvalued and we may decide to sell the stock or underweight the stock in our portfolio. So this approach is very simple, but it has many problems. First, so there are many valuation ratios that investors can potentially use. So for instance, instead of P ratio, an investor may use price to sales. The price to sales ratio is popular because sometimes firms may have negative earnings, especially young firms. And when firms have negative earnings, P ratio is not defined. So some investors prefer to use the price to sales ratio rather than price to earnings ratio. And other investors prefer other ratios as well. So then investors often disagree about which ratio is the best to value a stock. Let's look at an example of Microsoft. Here's the uh, valuation ratios for Microsoft and the, uh, the average ratios for the software applications industry where Microsoft is operating. So if you look at the price to earnings ratio or P ratio, Microsoft appears to be undervalued. So Microsoft is trading at about 22 times the earnings, whereas other firms in the same industry were trading at almost at 40 times the earnings. So Microsoft appears to be significantly undervalued. If you look at or the price to earnings ratio. But if we were to use price to sales ratio, Microsoft appears to be overvalued this time. Okay. So Microsoft is trading at 7.25 times the sales, and other firms in the same industry are trading at 6.42 times the sales. So which one is it? Is Microsoft undervalued or overvalued? So we're going to need more rigorous valuation models to sort through these potentially conflicting signals of value, which is the second approach that we're going to focus on. The second approach is to use discounted cash flow valuation techniques that we have developed in the previous lectures.
So this kind of cash flow valuation or simply called DCF valuation, the value of an investment of any investment is simply the present value of all future cash flows associated with the investment. Simply the, the value of investment is the present value of all future cash flows from that investment. So to value a stock, then we have to think about cash flows for stockholders. So if you buy a share of stock, essentially you can receive cash in two ways. First, company pays dividends, and you can sell your shares either to another investor in the market or back to the company. So for instance, so suppose you're thinking of purchasing the stock of a company and you expect the company to pay $2 dividend in one year. And you believe that you can sell the stock for $14 at the time. So these are your cash flows. So if you require a return of 20% on investment like this, then what is the maximum price you'll be willing to pay? In other words, how much is the stock worth? This is simply the present value of these cash flows. So P0, the current price should be D1 over 1 plus R times P1 over 1 plus R. So this is the present value of next period dividend and the price plus the present value of next period price. So 2 over 1.2 plus 14 over 1 plus 2. So this is equal to $13 and 33 cents. So this is our estimate of the stock price or stock value. What if you want to hold a stock for two years instead of one year? Will the value of the stock change? So let's think about the cash flows. In this case, in addition to the dividend in one year, which is $2, You expect a dividend of two dollars and ten cents in two years, and you expect a stock price of fourteen dollars and seventy cents at the end of year two. So now, how much should you be willing to pay? So what's the present value of these cash flows? So now, the present value of these cash flows or P0 is D1 over 1 plus R, which is the first period, first year dividend, plus D2 over 1 plus R squared, which is the second year dividend, will be discounted twice, plus P2, which is the second period price, discounted twice, so over 1 plus R squared, so 2 over 1.2 plus 2.1 over 1.2 squared plus 14.7 over 1.2 squared. Then you get $13.33. This is equal to the price 
that you got in the previous example, in a one period example. So as you can see here, the, the value of a stock doesn't really depend on how long you hold the stock. Because when you sell your stock, the owner of the stock changes, not its value. The value stays the same. So this is not a coincidence. So if you go back to one period example, suppose you sell your stock at the end of year one, then someone would buy it, right? So how much the other investor will willing to pay for the stock? Well, it should depends on the other investors, the new buyers, or expected cash flows. For instance, if this investor will hold the stock for another year, then he will get the dividend, D2, and then can sell it at P2. Then what's the value of this to this investor at the end of year one is where P1 is equal to the, the present value of this, so D2 over one plus R plus P2 over one plus R. So that's the uh, the value of these cash flows to this investor at the end of year one. So if you substitute this in here, then you get P0 is equal to D1 over 1 plus R, which is this, plus D2 over 1 plus R squared plus P2 over 1 plus r squared, okay, which is the same thing as this. So we can expand this further. So for instance, p2 should be d3 over 1 plus r, the next peer dividend, the present value of the next peer dividend and the present value of the next period price. Then we can substitute this in here. Then it will be the present value at the end of, at time zero, will be D1 over 1 plus R plus D2 over 1 plus R squared plus D3 over 1 plus r cubed plus p3 over 1 plus r cubed. Then you see a pattern here. You can extend this, extend this further. You can continue to push back the ear in which we we'll sell the stock. So in general, you can continue to if let's say if you sell your stock at time t, e of t, then it will be the present value of the dividends from year one to year t plus the present value of year t price. So pt divided by one plus r to the t. So this is sometimes called terminal price. Okay, so we can keep going like this. Then eventually you'll find that the price of a stock is just the present value of all expected future dividends. So all expected future dividends like this. Okay, so essentially, in order to estimate the value of a stock, you have to estimate all future dividends. So in other words, D1, D2, D3, and so forth. So you have to estimate the, the next, uh, this year's dividend, and the next year's dividend, dividend year after that, 
and so forth. So that's a lot of dividends to estimate. That's a lot of numbers to estimate. So this model, the, this general version of the model, is not particularly useful because, because of this problem. So in order to make this model more applicable in practice, we have to make some simplifying assumptions about the pattern of future dividends. So these are some special cases that we use in practice. The simplest assumption that we can make is that the dividend has, it stays at the same level. So for instance, if D0 is the last year's dividend, then you assume that company keeps paying D0 in the future. So dividend has zero growth rate. And we are familiar with this type of cash flows. So this is a, a perpetuity. So the price, stock price, assuming that there is no growth, is simply D0 over 1 plus R plus D0 over 1 plus R squared plus D0 over 1 plus R cubed and so forth. So we know that this simplifies to D0 over R. So this is a present value of a perpetuity. So let's look at an example. Suppose a stock is expected to pay a dividend of $2 per share every year, and the required return is 10%. The question is, how much would you be willing to pay for this stock? Well, you can use this um, perpetuity present value formula. So the price should be $2 divided by 10%. So $20 per share. So the zero growth model is appropriate for stocks that have zero growth. So the preferred stock has the uh, as constant dividend uh, indefinitely. But, but ordinary common stocks, uh, this model is too simplistic because companies tend to increase dividends in the future and also investors would like the companies to increase uh, dividends in the future. The second uh, special case is to assume, okay, we can assume where the dividend grows at a constant rate okay, at G. Okay, so then the general model simplifies considerably to see this, so given D, D0, so D0 is the last year's uh, dividend, and D1 is D0 times 1 plus G, and D2 is D0 times 1 plus G squared, and D3 is D0 times 1 plus G cubed, and so forth. Okay, so dividends grows at a rate of G. Then, if you substitute this in, in the general formula, then you get this. The present value becomes this. And this is a growing perpetuity. So this looks almost like a perpetuity, but the cash flows are growing at a constant rate. So this type of cash flow is called growing perpetuity. So 
So the present value of growing perpetuity looks like this. And this simplifies to, we can do a similar algebra trick that we did when we studied chapter six, then we will get D zero times one plus G over R minus G. So that is the present value formula for growing perpetuity. So we can use this to value a stock using if you were to, we are willing to assume that our uh, future dividends will grow at a constant rate. So when the growth rate is zero, then this becomes D zero over R. So constant growth model includes zero growth model as a special case. So this is more general And this model is called the dividend growth model. And in old textbook, this model may be called the golden growth model. But Gordon uh, is not the first one to apply this model. And it's been around for a while, for a very long time. So it's a generic, the term is more appropriate. So this dividend growth model, so let's look at, uh, different growth model uh, in this example. Suppose the company just paid an annual dividend of $2 per share. So D0 is $2. And the company is expected to increase its dividend by 2% per year. So G is 2%. If the market requires a return of 15%, on assets like this, so R is 15%. And the question is, how much should the stock be selling for? Well, we can use the uh, dividend growth model or constant growth model to estimate its value. The price should be, so two times, one plus 0 0.02 over R minus G, so this is 0.15 minus 0.02. If you solve this, then you get $15 and 69 cents. So this is the constant uh, growth model. So constant growth model is appropriate for firms that are in mature industry or maybe appropriate for the market index in a in developed country. It may not be appropriate for many individual companies because their growth stages are different. So young firms may be <clears throat> uh, paying less are uh, paying out less and retain more earnings to reinvest for the future, for future growth. And mature companies are paying out most of their, their earnings to their shareholders. The companies may be in different stages of growth. So we, more, we need a little bit more flexible model. So this is the next model, which is called non-constant growth model. So essentially the dividend growth doesn't have to be constant initially, but set it down to constant growth at some point. So, So for instance, in the first stage, the growth, dividend growth is not consistent. 
So it can be really anything, but eventually finds an equilibrium, converges to some constant number, okay, which is happens in the second stage at time at some point in time t. So the sec in the second stage, we can estimate the value of the stock price at time t or terminal price using constant growth model to value this terminal price and then estimate the dividends from year one to year t which will be the first stage. So we can use this T period model to value a stock. So let's look at an example. So in this example, the company just paid an annual dividend of three dollars per share. So D zero is three. And the company will increase its dividend by 7% next year. It will then reduce its dividend growth rate by two percentage points per year until it reaches the industrial average of 3% dividend growth, after which the company will keep a constant growth rate forever. So D1 will be 3 times 1.07, because the yeah, company will increase its dividend by 7% next year. So this will be $3.21. And next period dividend would be three times 1.07 times 1.05. We'll decrease by two percentage point So there will be three dollars and thirty seven cents. Okay. So from here, we increase by another five percent. And then the growth rate next year and beyond that will be 3%. So we can use constant growth model to estimate the stock price at the end of year two. So this will be D2 times 1 plus G over R minus G. So that is 3.37 divided by R is, uh, the required return is 14%. So 0.14 minus 0 0.03. So that is equal to $31.56. So that's the terminal price. So that is terminal price. And the current price P0 will be P1 over 1 plus R plus D2 over 1 plus R squared plus P2 over 1 plus R squared. So 3.21 over 1.14 plus 3.37 over 1.14 squared plus 31.56 over 
1.14 squared. So that is equal to $29.69. So that's the, uh, our estimate of the value of a stock. So we've seen this, this the uh, different growth model uh, from the discounted cash flow valuation. So we've talked about the uh, the prices, and we haven't really talked about uh, the uh, the required return. Okay, we have learned that the the stock price depends on dividends and dividend growth. But we haven't really talked about the required return. It also depends on the required return. We're going to study more about uh, study this in uh, in a later chapter, but we will see this. Uh, we talk a little bit about the uh, required return in in this lecture. So, the using the dividend growth model, we have so the dividend growth model tells us that p zero is D zero times one plus G over R minus G. This is equal to D one over, so this is D one R minus G. So you can solve for R, then you get D one over P zero plus G. So this total return can be decomposed into two parts, dividend yield and capital gains yield. So total return is equal to dividend yield plus capital gains yield. So here we use next period dividends, D1, which is called four dividend. So it's called four dividend yield instead of the last year's dividend, which is D0. So be careful, uh, don't be confused with four dividend yield with the trailing dividend yield, which is the last year's dividend, okay? So here, dividend yield is defined as a forward dividend yield. So this is very similar to the yield to maturity decomposition. So in the previous our previous lecture, we learned that yield to maturity is equal to current yield plus capital gains yield. So current yield is similar to dividend yield. So current yield is coupon divided by the bond price and Dividend is, is dividend divided by the stock price is quite similar. So we can use dividend growth model or the implications of the uh, different rearrangement of dividend growth model to estimate required return. So we can use instead of the uh, trying to estimate the value of a stock, if we take the current price as given and we estimate the future dividend growth rate to, in, to estimate the required return for the stock, okay? So let's do this using this example. So we're going to estimate required return for S&P 500 index. So constant dividend growth assumption is maybe appropriate, maybe more likely to be appropriate for the index because for individual firms, yes, some firms may have growing 
dividends or maybe other firms may have decreased in dividends, etc. But if you aggregate all this, then dividend growth may be more stable. So we're going to use the on dividends from S&P 500 firms compiled by Bob Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics a few years ago. He compiled this data very diligently. So the dividends uh, for S&P 500 index in 1919, it was 0.53. And in 2019, the dividend grew to 58.5. So the dividends has grown um, quite a bit over the past. So it grew, so we want to estimate their dividend growth rate. So we can use the future value formula to estimate compute the uh, dividend growth rate over this uh, past 100 years. They will get, she is about 4.81%. So over the past 100 years, the S&P 5 homes, S&P 500 firms increased dividends at a rate of 4.81%. So which is in line with the uh, U.S. on uh, the economy growth rate or GDP growth rate, for instance. So if you are to, willing to assume uh, that the S&P 500 firms continue to grow their dividends at this rate, then we can estimate the required return for S&P 500. So let's say today is April 17, 2020, and it's at 500 close at 2874.56. So that should be the current price. So using dividend growth model, the required return is dividend yields plus the capital gains here, the, the growth rate. So D1 is the D0, which is D0, the last year's dividend, times the growth rate, our estimate of growth rate. So that's D1 divided by the current index level, so the current price plus, so that's the, the four dividend yield, and the growth rate is 0 0.0481. Then you can estimate the uh, required return for SP 500 to be about. 6.94%, so about 7%. So if you look at the equation here, as usual, the returns and the prices should move in opposite directions. So if you estimate the required return for S&P 500, at a different date, you will get a different estimate. So you can use the current price or current S&P 500 index level to update your estimate. And you may use growth rate of about 4.8% because the, uh, uh, this estimate doesn't change very often. So you can keep, use, keep using it, or you can update uh, the S&P 500 index to update your estimate of 
SMP500 returns. So when SMP500 index is lower, so then we expect future returns to be high. So for instance, uh, during recessions, coming out of recessions, the market index will be low, then you expect higher returns going forward. So during bubbles, when S&P 500's index is high, because prices are inflated, then you expect lower returns going forward. In this way, prices and returns are related in opposite, uh, moving opposite directions, related in opposite way. So when prices are high, you expect lower returns going forward and vice versa. So this is all I want to talk about in this lecture. So thank you for watching. I will see you next class.